Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last lecture of EC 2026 Introduction to Signal Processing, we discussed sinusoidal signals whose frequency changed over time. In particular, we introduced the concept of instantaneous frequency. We looked at examples like this chirp waveform. And note that what you hear corresponds to what you see on the spectrogram. Here's a small portion of a time domain plot of that signal. Notice that if you look at any individual local portion, it looks like a sinusoid of a fixed frequency. It's only when you look at a larger portion of the waveform that you see the frequency variation clearly. Now for the instantaneous frequency you might compute to correspond to a frequency that you perceive, the frequency has to be changing slowly enough. If you start to crank up the frequency of modulation, you can actually distort the waveform and all kinds of weird things happen. Let's take a look at this page on wideband FM signals on the DSP First website. Here we have a formula implementing frequency modulation, although technically this is phase modulation. We're not adding a sinusoidal variation to the carrier frequency FC in here. We're leaving that alone, and we're adding the sinusoidal phase term. FC is the carrier frequency, FM is the frequency of modulation, and the DF here is actually a typo. To be consistent with the notation on the rest of this web page, this should be beta, and it's called the index of modulation. So let's scroll down a little bit. There's four examples. Each example has the same carrier, but a different frequency of modulation, and the index of modulation is being changed so that the total frequency deviation, at least according to the formula for the instantaneous frequency, remains the same. Here's the first example. You hear the distinct changes in frequency, and you can see that on the spectrogram. Now we're going to increase from 4 cycles per second in terms of our frequency of modulation to 16 cycles per second. Here it's a little bit trickier, but you can still hear a distinct warble, and the overall range of frequencies that we see stays the same. Now we're going to increase the frequency of modulation by a factor of 4 again. Oh, now we don't hear that distinct variation. Something very strange is going on. Notice that on the spectrogram, you see some content beyond that 400 to 700 range we saw earlier. Now let's increase the frequency of modulation by a factor of 2. Now you definitely hear a distinct new kind of tone. So we have our main carrier frequency, but now we have these sidebands. Wideband frequency modulation is very different than narrowband frequency modulation. And in fact, you can use this wideband modulation as the basis for synthesizing musical tones. So mathematically speaking, you can always compute an instantaneous frequency, but it's not particularly useful unless the frequency is changing slowly enough. Let's go back to the DSP First website, click on Spectrum Representation, and then click on FM Synthesis. I won't go through the details of this here. You can check that out on your own. I just want to play these examples. Here's a brass example. Clarinet. Bell. And a knocking sound. The time variation in those examples is created by varying the index of modulation slowly over time and modulating the amplitude of the overall waveform slowly over time. If we go back to this Chapter 3 section of the DSP First website and scroll down a little bit, you can find some example lab assignments using MATLAB, including this lab on FM synthesis for musical instruments. So, if you're looking for something to do, you can check that out and try it yourself. All of the instructions you need are given here. Notice that in addition to the PDF, you'll want to click on the Files link here 
to get the fmsynthlab.zip file. And you don't need a MATLAB license. You should be able to do the lab using the free software Octave. FM synthesis for music, as we generally think about it now, was patented by Stanford researcher John Chowning. Stanford approached a number of companies looking to see if anyone wanted to license it, and I suspect that most companies didn't understand it or generally weren't sure what to do with it. And eventually they approached Yamaha, and they eventually came out with a DX7, which wound up obliterating the competition. Now, the original prototypes of Yamaha's FM technology were massive, but Yamaha was a big company, so it had the resources needed to create the custom chips to bring it down to a reasonable size and cost. And patches from the DX7 are all over music from the 80s. The DX7 was as inevitable as Phil Collins. There were other instruments of the era capable of FM synthesis, such as the Synclavier and the digital keyboard synergy that I mentioned in an earlier lecture. And FM synthesis is a staple of instruments by Don Buchla. Modern desktop and laptop computers can easily perform FM synthesis, so there's a large number of plugins for digital audio workstations that will do that for you.